Austru, Austru, dragă trăguță, Mi-ai cerut ciora cu panglicuță, Și-ai mai vrea, și-ai mai vrea, și-ai mai vrea matale, Să-ți cumpere neica și sandale. Shalom, Rabbi Hassan. Bună ziua, zdravei, hello. <coughs> Many languages we speak. This is story 28. And uh, story 27, we had an introduction to an educational story. Uh, this story intends to be uh, a lesson, an analysis by Rabbi Haim Asa <coughs> from Burgas, Bulgaria, now in Fullerton, California, on how normal people can become evil, can become destructive, and can have no feelings towards their fellow humans. So here we are on a beautiful Monday afternoon, June 3rd, 2013, in Fullerton, California. Rabbi Asa. Thank you, David. <clears throat> I would like to begin with a lesson or an experiment that took place in Iowa, United States of America, in a school, normal school, like all of our schools, of good boys and good girls. Elementary school, uh, high school? It was, uh, I believe, either elementary or junior high. And what year did it happen? Uh, I would say probably mid-90s. Okay. So we have the setting mid-90s of elementary junior high school, young children. Young children. The teacher walked into the classroom one day <coughs> and said, we have now new rules. I would like all the brown-eyed students to sit on this side and the blue-eyed students to sit on this side of the classroom. And then she proceeded by saying, it is well known that the people with blue eyes are superior to the people with brown eyes. Therefore, from now on, you, the brown eyes, are going to be serving the blue eyes and fulfill their wishes and commands, etc., etc. Well, at the beginning, everybody thought this was a some kind of a joke, but he, she, <coughs> persisted in in her division of blue and brown eyes. Continuing with the experiment, but the children exactly. were not quite aware that it was yeah. an experiment. Yeah, no, they didn't know. And lunchtime came, and she said. Blue eyes go first, brown eyes go second. Lunch was over, and she said, blue eyes have first uh, choice of entering the classroom, and brown eyes have to wait. Within two weeks, the blue eyes started feeling much superior, much more in command, and the brown eyes became sort of like servants, like, yes, what would you like me to do for you today, blue eyes? Sheepish and meek and uh, subservient. Exactly. <coughs> so, <coughs> the experiment was to reverse the two groups. After two weeks. Yeah, and indeed, that morning, the teacher walked in and said there was a terrible mistake and it is not the blue eyes that are the superior, it is the brown eyes. And she reversed all the, the rules. All the rules, and now all of a sudden the blue eyes felt subservient, the brown eyes walked around proud and giving commands. What I'm trying to say is that within a short time, let's say a month or two, any human being can become a cruel part of the machinery of whatever the goal is. In the case of Iowa, it was, nobody was killed, right. nobody it was, was an hurt. Experiment. Yeah. But in the case, let's, let's say, the Hitler Youth of the 1930s. How it all started, because obviously they had the cooperation of millions <laughs> of people that were normal citizens, normal jobs, 
in all kinds of areas from doctors to yeah. uh, business people to workers and things like that. Germany had more PhDs and more more academics than any other country of Europe at that time. And lo and behold, all not all but many of them became part of the of the killing, machinery killing of machine. the killing machine. Now uh, as I mentioned before I was watching the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem of 1961 uh, yesterday on, on, on a channel, on a Jewish channel of Los Angeles and he was this very mild, well-mannered gentleman, polite, yeah. polite, educated, who became the architect of the genocide, okay? Now, in Germany, the Hitler, the, the, the educators, the Nazi uh, propaganda makers decided that all children that are, belong to the Hitler Youth, which was a great privilege, of course, would now learn how to use the bayonet of the rifles with which they were training. They had a knife at the end, so this yeah. is a very interesting part of the story. Yeah, the bayonet. The bayonet is the sharp uh, uh, the knife, knife the of, that you put on top of the rifle. And in their uh, weekly uh, Hitler Youth uh, meetings, Ex exercise and drills, extra, indoctr indoctrination right. and etc. etc. The uh, commander of the of the particular chapter uh, hung uh, burlap bags full of small uh, puppies, living puppies, living animals. puppies, and living uh, kittens. So, for all purposes, the bag was full of living animals who were, were really, shaking, yeah. who were really uh, very very uh, disturbed because here they were uh, put into a close quarters with other animals. And they were crying. And, and yes, and he hung it up on the ceiling of that particular club and after short indoctrination and command he said, okay now each of you children, they were teenagers, will take the bayonet, the rifle with the bayonet, and stick it into the burlap bag, meaning to say you will literally kill, kill, kill the animals or, or injure the animal. Now, you don't see the animals. The animals are <coughs> you hear them. burlap bag, but you hear their cries and, and, and the barking and, and the meowing. And indeed, this experiment became the model for training young boys and girls how to become murderers without batting an eye because you don't see the actual puppy that you love or the actual kitten that you adore you just put the bayonet and they hear the cries and this became the standard uh, educational tool of the uh, young Hitler youth how to become murderers. Now, without exaggerating, I would like to say that a good pedagogue, a good educator, could transform any group of young men and women or boys and girls into becoming the same. It takes uh, maybe two months, three months, four months of training and indeed, at the end of this experiment, uh, 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 which is no longer experiment, it's reality, uh, the person could become totally insensitive to suffering, totally sort of indoctrinated into the concept of superior race, superior color, or whatever it is. So what we, what we could add and put a little more color to, the, to this gruesome example is that besides the physical exercise uh, there was indoctrination in terms of the words that were said to the children 
as part of the psychology of brainwashing and programming that the children should destroy the animals or further on other human beings exactly. with all kinds of examples that this is a bad person, they don't deserve, they've done this, they look like this, they, exactly. they don't look like you and that's why you, it's okay what you're doing. So they rationalized and they indoctrinated these young minds and bent them out of shape to justify their goals. If you think that this is an impossibility or far-fetched uh, uh, case, think of lynching in the South. That's right. Only, only I mean, even in 1960, That's right. uh, 50 years ago, we had lynching in the South. Okay? I mean, uh, uh, people that were either black or some of them were white, who identified with the, yeah. with the, sympathized with the blacks. And uh, we have the case of the three martyrs of, uh, I believe it was Mississippi, where two of them were Jewish boys, uh, Andrew Schwager or whatever the name was, and the other one, and one was black. Right. And they were, they were arrest, arrested, they were captured by the uh, Ku Klux Klan, and they were murdered. Uh, and um, this, every child should learn in, in, in their history books that even 50 years ago, which is the age of, let's say, their grandfathers, that lynching was not common, but was a possible event in, in America, in the USA of the 19th century. Well, I think today, uh, with the advances in uh, psychology studies, sociology, and other sciences, we understand that the, what mob mentality means, and there are people that manipulate and understand the, the weaknesses in individuals when they join a mob, a group of people, and it changes the, the dimension of thinking and the, the, the actions, and uh, these are very dangerous situations. So that's why we are talking about this to teach and to understand not to become part of a mob mentality and not to allow yourselves to uh, listen to the wrong uh, people and uh, that's why education starts with your mother and your father. Exactly. And I have to tell you that in today's sports, sports being so popular and common, uh, even in, in young age like high school, that all of a sudden you have the, 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 the sort of superiority right. or the supremacy of the football uh, um, um, star. Right, the jocks. Yeah, compared to some kid who really li likes to read a book rather than playing football in the field. Right. So, this, this kind of mentality has to be uh, changed. That each individual is primed for his or her talents and should fulfill <coughs> them and not look down upon the bookie or the guy that is uh, a nerd, let's say in the school, or um, uh, the, the, the person that's not popular, that he is less of a person because he doesn't participate in whatever activity the majority or the popularity demands. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, thank you very much for sharing with us such extraordinary observations and I hope they're useful to everyone that is watching. and. Uh, I'd like to insert a, a comment that's, in my opinion, as my children are now 12, uh, Jacob and Jessica is 15, and they are very deeply involved with sports, with tennis, uh, my belief from everything that I see is that sports, like thousands of years ago, with the Romans and the Greeks and so on, sports is a way to show your character, your morality. It's not about kicking a ball or just the running, it's about showing what a real human being you are and to create a standard and an example. And that's why the Olympics has 
being born again in the same spirit of uniting people and let the best person win, not the one that's connected politically, not the one with the most money, and so on and so forth. So that's why to me, people that are into sports are ambassadors of good character and good morality. So hopefully this is what will happen everywhere. Yeah, thank you, David. And I would like to speak at the next segment about the 1936 Olympics in oh, Berlin, yes. Oh, yes. and then probably bring it to Munich 1970. of 1972. Uh, right. Well, thank you. Stay tuned. Uh, this was story 28, so right coming up next is story 29. So thank th you. Thank you, Rabbi Asa. Buzunarele sunt goale tal Mai a fui trecuță Încă o băncuță Și bă ui în colitruță tal 